like to call this uh, joint uh, meeting between the Senate and House uh, Ag Committees uh, to order um, and welcome all you folks here. Uh, this uh, legislation uh, in this report was developed through legislation last session to have uh, the agency of ag come up with a strategic plan and something to look uh, to the future and reference back and try to set up a track that we could follow uh, in some orderly fashion and uh, Many people have spent many hours uh, putting this together, and it's kind of exciting uh, to be here uh, early in the session and, and uh, have this report given. Uh, to start off, uh, Carolyn, did you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, I would just say thank you to the folks who worked on this. I think this was a, a, a pretty uh, comprehensive process, and we we thank, uh, in particular, Alan Kaler and Abby Willard for their work on this, and all of the people who contributed to this piece of work. Yeah, so we'll um, take just a minute and run quickly around the room and introduce the committee members. And Terry, you want to start on your side? Sure. Um, Representative Terry Norris, I represent Benson, Orwell, Shoreham, and Whiting with the Addison Rutland District. I'm Representative Tom Bach. I represent the town of Chester, Andover, Baltimore, and North Springfield. Senator Brian Caldemore from the Rutland District. <coughs> Senator Ruth Hardy from the Addison District. Representative Rodney Graham, Orange One District, <coughs> Williamstown, Chelsea, Orange, North Shore, Grant. Uh, Representative Carolyn Partridge, I represent the towns of Athens, Brookline, Grafton, part of North Westminster, all of Rockingham, and my hometown of Wyndham. Yes. Uh, well, I'm Bobby Starr, and I'd like to mention the towns that I represent. Uh, <laughs> but there's 42 of them, so I think I'll pass. I uh, represent <laughs> Orleans and Essex County, parts of Lamoille, and a little bit of Franklin. Uh, pleasure to be here. Chris Pearson, uh, Senator from Chittenden. Representative John Bartholomew from Parkland, also representing Windsor and West Windsor. Senator Anthony Polito, Washington County. Representative Vicki Strong, I live in Albany and represent seven towns in the Northeast Kingdom, Orleans, Caledonia, one. Representative O'Brien, I represent Royalty and my hometown of Cambridge. Representative Sharon Fugard, um, my district includes Highgate, Franklin, Berkshire, and Richford. So, um, welcome uh, everyone again, and um, as you can see how well the Senate and House get along, we're all divided up proportionately, uh, mixed in with reps, uh, but, um, but seriously, we do work well together, and, and uh, that's the way your government should work as well, and we try to, try to do that. I guess the first uh, presenter is our Secretary of Agriculture, Ransom Tebbets. Thank you. Well, you all, uh, you all have it, so here yep. it is. And uh, it's quite comprehensive. And uh, for the record, uh, Ansel Tebbets with the Agency of Agriculture, Food, and Markets. And uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to present this a comprehensive report on strengthening uh, Vermont agriculture. We are here uh, because Vermont sets the table. The farmers and food companies set the table with our award-winning dairy, uh, maple, apples, fresh vegetables, specialty products, and much more. This plan lays out a strategy to stimulate more rural economic development and brings Vermont products to people throughout Vermont and beyond. Our goal is to improve the lives of Vermont's hardworking farmers and producers while delivering world-class food to consumers. Just a few of the findings uh, in this report. 
Uh, between 2007 and 2017, the Vermont food system economic output expanded from 7.5 billion to 11.3 billion. Food manufacturing is the second largest manufacturing industry uh, in Vermont. Over 64,000 Vermonters are directly employed by over 11,500 farms and food-related businesses. These are all impressive numbers, but we can do more. Governor Scott, the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets, the legislature, and public and private partners like Farm to Plate are committed to improving and growing Vermont's economy. Any discussion about improving the rural economy in Vermont should include a plan about agriculture. We heard yesterday from Governor Scott and his commitment, the governor proposing more support for Vermont agriculture by increasing the working lands program by $750,000. This is just part of the plan. There is much more. This plan will outline goals, objectives, and strategies. It is a comprehensive look at more than two dozen fields that are part of the agriculture landscape. The plan's goals include greater collaboration and stronger approaches to product development, storage and processing, marketing and distribution. <coughs> These ideas will be further developed in the coming year and coming years. It's a plan that outlines the current conditions examines the bottlenecks and the gaps, looks at opportunities, and makes a set of recommendations. In a moment, you'll hear more details from the authors and those who put this plan together. Vermont's rural com communities are tied to our economy, to our identity, and our way of life. While at the same time, all of Vermont suffers when our farm and forestry sectors falter. The agency and Vermont Farm to Plate and the legislature are taking steps to build on our strengths and innovate for the future. In collaboration with a wide variety of farmers, producers, and business development experts, the plan asks the Agency of Agriculture to set the table for the future of Vermont. Our current agriculture economy is encouraging. Amid the gaps and bottlenecks, the plan outlines the opportunities we all can relate to that award-winning cheese, the crisp Vermont produce and fruit, our award-winning meats, a brew or a cider, our specialty products, and top-notch forest products, and so much more. At the same time, these numbers behind the foods illustrate the magnitude of Vermont's farmer's contribution, as well as its strength and potential in the Vermont food and farm industry. So how do we grow others' preferences to these products? Ultimately, Vermont's agriculture story illustrates the power of rural communities and how much more we'll accomplish when we harness that power. And our next steps, the plan also asks our policymakers to research and develop recommendations to stabilize and revitalize Vermont's agriculture industry. We invite you, our private and public partners, and our industry leaders to review this plan, get in touch with us, offer their comments and suggestions, and of course, act. We will come together for a bright future in agriculture in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you, Anderson. Thanks, um, Anderson. Um, so I think next on the list is Abby Willard. Um, I didn't know. I don't know if you wanted to take questions at this point, or if I think I think it makes sense maybe to run through the presentation and save our questions to the end. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Well, thank you. I thought you were going separately. Otherwise, I would have introduced Ellen too. That's okay. Yes. Thanks. Um, so thanks for joining today for this presentation and discussion about the Agriculture and Food System Plan published in 2020 that was outlined in Section 160, or yeah, the Senate Bill 160, Section 1, which became Act 83 back in May of 2019, as Senator Starr alluded to. So the Agency of Agriculture contracted with the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund to collaborate on the development and delivery 
of this plan to your committees per the legislative request. In such a challenging economic time for our agricultural industry and specifically dairy, where we're really experiencing evolving consumer trends, a transitions of land ownership, shifting climate patterns, different landscape and business pressures, new market innovation, new product innovation. There was agreement that there truly is a need for a plan for the future of agriculture in our state. So this report that we present today is a compilation plan of 23 briefs focused on markets, products, and issues that represent some of the most critical spots for stabilization, revitalization, and diversification of agriculture in Vermont. The report is the result of a truly collaborative process, so led by two organizations, the Agency of Agriculture and Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund, with 23 lead authors from within the ag and food sector that offered their leadership and expertise in the various topic areas, and over 130 total contributors that shared their perspective and knowledge towards the 23 briefs that are contained in the report. So I just wanted to briefly acknowledge the team that pulled together this document. So under the direction of Secretary Tevitz and Deputy Secretary Eastman, who couldn't be here today, the team from the agency was myself and Kyle Harris. In a collaborative effort with Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund, <coughs> Ellen Kaler and her team, including leadership support from Jake Claro, Sarah Danley, Becca Warren, and others. And then the lead authors and brief contributors who provided content, they reviewed language, they offered their ideas, and they proposed the recommendations. So would it be acceptable for those individuals in this room to just acknowledge themselves to you? So you have a sense sure. of who would they yeah. like to stand? So would people stand? If you were a contributor or an author on a brief <laughs> or a part of the agency. Oh, that's yeah. right. So our vision, put in motion by your request, was for the Agency of Agriculture and the SJF to use the development of these briefs as a comprehensive representation of what's currently happening in agriculture and offer very specific and robust recommendations that could influence policy creation, new program development, staff expansion, and funding appropriations. The goal was to really look at the products, the markets, and the issues facing Vermont's agriculture currently and offer a strategy for that stabilization, diversification, and revitalization of the ag industry in the state. And also explore how this is going to impact our rural economy and affect our local and regional food system. So as you might expect, the consensus was we want to keep agriculture a vibrant land use within our state. And there's many recommendations of how to get there. Over 119 are offered in this plan. Many of those recommendations require additional staff and resources. And the suggestions are each complex and require a systematic scaling up of support and assistance. So our hope is that you as policymakers and other agency leadership and producer associations and funders will review these briefs and the recommendations as a foundation for a plan to support and maintain a viable agricultural industry in our state in response to the transitions we're all seeing in our communities and upon the agricultural working landscape. So thanks for the vision, and we're excited to sort of dig in and spend time talking about what we found. Thanks. Thank you. Ellen? Um, and uh, to put an even finer point on, on Abby's last point, um, the plan is coming out now, and we have no expectation that everything, all the recommendations are going to get implemented in the next year. We are, we are really trying to set things up for the next five. 
So there are some of the recommendations, and we spent a little time with them. Um, you know, are ready. There are some things that are ready for you to consider this session, and other things that may take a couple more years to really gestate and be able to um, really clarify what is going to be of greatest need. Some of the recommendations don't require legislative action. They're going to be things that farm to plate network member organizations will be taking on. So, but, it, but we really felt it was important to provide a comprehensive look at all the types of recommendations that would move uh, the farm and food sector forward. And I, and I just want to really call attention to, um, on page seven at the top, this is, um, we, we asked Roger Albee as sort of the grandfather of a lot of this important work and the, and the, and the historian of, of local agriculture. Um, and to, he really, I think, provided a great historical overview that is so relevant for today, which is that over the last 150 plus years, it's been the ingenuity of Vermont farmers and their ability to recognize market niches that has allowed them to adapt to economic forces and market changes, many of which are beyond their control. And so it is, and what we have found, and you will see throughout these briefs, that it is once again time for substantive change and adaptation within Vermont's agriculture industry. The market forces and conditions are such that adaptation and change at a, a fairly rapid pace is required. Um, and, that, and, and that's in part because of the climate change, water quality, land use patterns, changing consumer preferences and markets, which are all really forcing us to accelerate that adaptation. And so we, our hope is that through these, these briefs and the recommendations, that it provides a bit of a roadmap for how we might go forward with that. And it does uh, suggest that it's not going to happen without additional investment of people and, and, uh, and money. Um, so I wanted to just uh, walk you through uh, the brief, or the, the structure of this. So if you want to turn to page 13, there are nine product briefs. We have many more product briefs that are currently under development, but we chose these nine to present to you this session because we felt these were the ones that um, had some both greatest need and greatest opportunity. So the way that these briefs are structured, if you turn to the next page on apples, there is an upfront section of sort of what's at stake. And our intention is that like, if you only read one part of a brief, read the what's at stake. <laughs> because that will give you a, a synopsis of like what's really important here about, in this case, apples. Then there are, is a short current condition section, which, provide, which also provides some data points to help augment what is discussed in terms of the current conditions going on, in this case with apples. The next page over, then followed by bottlenecks and gaps, as well as opportunities. Uh, and then a, followed by a series of, of five around five recommendations per brief. Now what I, I want to just point down to the very bottom right of any of the briefs, it says this brief was prepared by, and it provides a lead author and a set of contributors. And what's really important to understand, I think, is that this, the text that's in this document is not that of the agency and the jobs fund getting together and just having a brain dump, right? This is about um, thoughtful experts with real on the ground knowledge who contributed their time, mostly in a volunteer capacity, to do this work for all of us. So the, we, we required that each of the, law, the lead authors had several private sector uh, members be part of that co contributions team because we wanted to make sure that these recommendations and the input was grounded in what's happening on the ground as well as what the research and the data suggests. So, uh, and we asked that in the review process, after the first draft was prepared, then it went back to the, to the contributors and the lead author, that in essence, they all agreed, yep, this is an accurate reflection of what we think is going on. So this is not what's the, only what the lead author thinks. This is truly a shared notion of what's important to know about apples, about cheese, about dairy, and such. So these are folks, for instance, you can bring in for further testimony, and they will um, be happy to do so. If you flip to page 43, 
you will see we have four market briefs where we cover direct markets, which are your farmers markets, CSAs and such, school for food procurement, uh, college and hospital procurement, and grocers. If you've, and, and so four more briefs there. Then if you flip to page 59, you will see that there are nine uh, issue briefs on climate change, water quality, succession planning, supporting future farmers is about helping the next generation of farmers get onto the land, uh, access to capital, business and technical assistance, consumer demand, agriculture, <coughs> and food access and farm viability. So we are covering a wide swath of both production agriculture as well as the food system in, at, in total uh, and providing a sense of, of what are these, what's going on. Each one of these briefs is two to four pages long, with the exception of dairy, which is eight pages. And uh, we think that they uh, provide a really uh, a wonderful synopsis of what is going on uh, in, the, in the field. Please? Yeah. OK. So um, if we flip back, um, so I just wanted you to understand the structure of the report. <laughs> Um, there were, in looking at the 119 recommendations that came out of the totality of these briefs, we noticed that the, that the recommendations fell into a couple, a few different themes as being uh, where we want to really focus. And those themes are around marketing, and that's both marketing of individual products that individual producers need to improve their, their overall marketing abilities as well as the state of Vermont as a whole needing to do a better job of marketing a totality of Vermont products or particular subsectors uh, of products. Another theme was around market development. That really relates to the need to open up new market for our products get into. So for instance, getting into more wholesale markets, whether that's grocery stores in Vermont or in, across New England. It might be figuring out how to develop uh, a better aggregation uh, opportunity for grass-fed beef farmers who can then sell that aggregated beef um, with high quality uh, standards and attributes into, say, the New York City marketplace, as a for instance. So that's market development of, of really uh, looking at the entire process of getting product into the market. Another uh, theme is around the, the need for business and technical assistance to support our farm and food business owners. Um, what we will notice in the recommendations, if you were to count them all up, uh, and this is the first time that any of us have actually done this. We've all known we need more boots on the ground helping farmers and business owners, but we've never done the exercise of actually counting it up. And we counted 17 additional full-time uh, individuals that are needed to be based at Extension, at the agency, at NOFA, at, at um, any of the other farm viability uh, uh, service provider organizations. Some of it is for succession planning, and you'll hear from Ella Chapin about that. And some of it is very technical, like we don't have a livestock specialist in the state. We need, the apple industry desperately needs a full-time uh, technical advisor on apple production. So there are some very concrete uh, personnel needs that we've identified. And then uh, the other theme, the other theme is around product research and development. We don't know yet what the next hard cider equivalent or CBD infused such and such is that has real potential, market potential. But as, as I, I, we said in, at, up front, and, and that Roger so eloquently says, it's about looking for these niche products where we can have the greatest opportunity for profitability and that we will always uh, be challenged to be com competing in a commodity market. So we used to have the Vermont uh, Artisan Cheese Institute at the University of Vermont. That doesn't exist anymore. But that was a foundational institute that helped lead to the, the unbelievable artisan cheese industry that we have today. And probably you could argue that without having had that institute for the years we did, we wouldn't have the level of cheese the diversity of the cheese production that's going on today. At this point, all we have is the Proctor Maple Center in terms of actual product research. We think that there's a real need for additional uh, public investment in having product development happening. 
So I guess what I would add is, so these 23 briefs are just the beginning. There's an additional set of products and markets and issues that aren't yet included and have not yet been drafted, and as Ellen said, is in that second tier of briefs that will be produced within the next year and presented to you at about this same time in 2021. Yeah, and I guess they are listed on the back page. That cover has the list of additional briefs that are currently under development with another whole set of lead authors and set of contributors. So in relation to the themes that Ellen mentioned, there's very specific recommendations that talk about the need for more business assistance that's focused on, say, accounting and bookkeeping assistance. There's recommendations around the infrastructure needs as to whether that's for dairy or building a goat industry that's more robust in the state or looking at um, produce infrastructure investments. There's recommendations that speak about the money that's needed to invest in value-added production, whether that's in a variety of maple products or apple products, as examples. There's, um, as Ellen mentioned, that need for increased marketing efforts and market access, so whether that's reaching retail markets or understanding the procurement in farm to school and other farm to institutions for both producers and processors. So overall, I would say there's additional annual investments needed to support these efforts that are outlined in the recommendations. There is a need for more boots on the ground, whether it's the 17 additional technical assistance positions over time. And there's a need for identification of the organizations that can do this work and what they need to scale up to offer the support that the industry needs. So uh, if, if you were to um, flip to page 91, there's one other section uh, to call your attention to, which is some supplemental materials. And these relate directly to the legislative request that was made. There was a few additional components besides the plan itself that you all asked for. One was a, a, uh, a sense of who are the capital providers available to invest in farms and food businesses. And um, I w I've got two copies uh, for the Senate committee and two copies for the House committee. Uh, we, the Jobs Fund Repride updated uh, an inventory that we had first published back in 2011 of all the capital <coughs> providers in the state that will provide debt, equity, grants, you name it, to farm and food businesses. So we went through and updated that. There are 64 unique capital providers, some of whom are regional, but they all they do actually invest in companies in Vermont. Um, and there are about 113, I think, unique uh, funding programs that are out there. This um, Excel spreadsheet is on your web page. It went up there this morning, and it's going to be uh, made available to any of the applicants that that uh, for Working Lands Enterprise Fund, and we'll get it out far and wide. Um, so I have copies of, of that that I can leave with you. They'll just give you a sense of the breadth and the depth of the types of capital that's out there. And you'll hear a little later from Janice St. Ange, who was the lead author on the, on the access to capital brief. Secondly, uh, there is a business assistance continuum, uh, basically a business uh, a farm and food business development <coughs> directory that's also been under development that, that is coming from the Working Lands Enterprise Board. And I've been working on that with Lynn Allen Schmoller uh, at the agency. It will be an actual online tool. And we will roll, they will, that will be rolled out and uh, demonstrated to you all on February 6th when uh, the Working Lands Day is happening and the hearing will be taking place. But basically what it is is a, um, uh, a web page that you can go to and click on what you're looking for. Like I'm a farm and I'm looking for a grant to invest, it, to be able to do some infrastructure investment. And what will come up from that search is all the entities that can provide business and technical assistance to that farm or food business. 
So it, the intention is to be sort of a portal to accelerate uh, and match make between farm and food businesses with uh, advisors that can support and help them. So that, so that's not, the link to it is in here, but obviously it's a, it's a web interface, so we couldn't publish it. <laughs> but that's also coming, and it was one of those things that you requested in the yeah. legislation. Um, and then thirdly, the, we had a, a piece about uh, collaborating with NOFA and Vermont Feed about some farm to school products and opportunities. Uh, and you'll see here, they had produced a pretty extensive, did, done some survey work and a pretty extensive report. We didn't want to include that in here because it's really a standalone useful document that bears some uh, attention in and of itself. So we provided the link to where that document is and, and you can um, both check that out and as well as have um, Betsy Rosenbluth and others come in and, and speak with you. So there are these other supplemental uh, materials that uh, I think will be very helpful to you all in understanding the landscape. Oh, and one other thing, just uh, uh, on the business assistance continuum, if you flip to page 78, there is a graphic so that you can see, it, the, the graphic doesn't, it's not the exact same thing as the portal, but just for a quick, so that you have a sense, what we did do was we reached out to and identified all the different, uh, biz this is for business assistance, so helping with business planning, uh, enterprise analysis, how to raise capital, those kinds of things. We identified all the organizations that can provide some amount of service either to farms or food and or food businesses along this continuum of a stage of development. So some entities have specific programs that are really designed for more startup or, or uh, new and beginning farmers, while other programs are really designed for more mature uh, businesses that are accessing, say, retail markets. So we, we know who they are. We've collected their information. And this is the, a lot of what's, uh, and their information is what's going into this uh, web-based portal that is, uh, that is currently being fine-tuned and ready, getting ready to be released. Well, sounds sounds good. Has has a plan like this ever been put together prior? Or is this first one that you folks can think remember? Or? Well, 2011 was the farm to plate well, strategic we did plan. That one. Yeah, and so <laughs> that that was very lengthy, and it, and at the time, I think that's what was required and what was really going to be most helpful because we were all in a place of trying to understand what is this thing called the food system, right? We didn't even use that language as much, right? Agri production agriculture is a, com a very important part of a larger food system, right? So that that plan laid had a number of had about 52 high priority recommendations in that plan, which we're going to be evaluating uh, over the next year to see like how many of these did we actually accomplish. But I have having read through them about three years in, we had already accomplished a lot of those recommendations. So you know, but that was 10 years ago, yeah. right? So this uh, iteration. I think is the next generation of a plan, yeah. and it builds off of what we knew, but it could be much shorter because we all know more now. We couldn't have written a plan like this 10 years ago. Yeah, it, it just, it wasn't possible. But the fact that we had so many people, like, I don't think anybody actually said no to us when we asked them, could you write this brief? Mm -hmm. Everybody said yes. And everybody put an, uh, dozens of hours into writing their brief. And in, in some cases, there were authors that told us, wow, I'm really glad I did this process because it actually helped to clarify for my sector what it is we should be focusing on. So they really took it seriously. Um, and, they're, and they're planning to use it as a guiding document for their own work on the ground. Yep. And I would say there's a variety of other plans and reports out there that are in development or recently produced that speak about the future of agriculture and strategies and recommendations, you know, as part of a plan about how to support dairy or maintain a working landscape going forward. Not quite organized in that they're by product, market, and supporting issue, 
quite like this plan is. But there's a lot of great minds that are thinking about this topic and really passionate about putting forth suggestions for what the future looks like. This is an amazing, amazing piece of work. In a very short period of time. In a very short period of time. I can't believe that you've accomplished this. So. And I will say that my team actually took off between Christmas and New Year's and did not work on this. So I'm glad you took off. <laughs> Now or should I hold uh, it? Um, are we going to hear from uh, Laura and others? Well, before? so what happens, what we proposed next, and I don't know, Senator, if your question is more around the process or a specific. It's not about the process, it's just something that you said about product development that I wanted to. But, yeah. but, but do you, are you, Mr. Chair? <laughs> uh, well, chair. <laughs> you, you're okay. It for okay. Couple minutes. So, uh, I think, I think Abby, you said something about the need for investment in product development mm -hmm. as one of your sort of broader recommendations, and that sort of speaks to the technical assistance piece that you were talking about. Um, and the reason I'm asking is it kind of directly contradicts um, testimony that we heard last week from people at the Mad River Food Hub who came in and spoke to us about their transition and what's happening there. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about how there's actually plenty of products being developed, but, but the real crucial thing is marketing. And you talked about both. You, yeah. you know, say that we need marketing too, but they're, they're sort of, at least what I got out of it, was the thrust should be on marketing because Right now, we have products that just there's no market for them, or or we have pro producers who don't know how to get their products to market. Yeah. Um, so that the marketing needs to come before we develop more products that we can't sell. So I just wondered if you could speak to that because that was what I heard from them. And it's yeah, I mean I think both are true. I think um, some of the product research and development recommendations that we found or that, that were presented in these briefs maybe had to do with um, thinking grain production of you know what are the research what grain varieties grow well in Vermont and could be value added to be used in um, you know beer production or as feed sources um, or for baking or other you know value added products um, in Vermont. So I think there's some product development and research that's still needed. It may not be making more salsas and sauces and soups and certain things that may be under production at the food hub level, um, and that those products actually need more market access and more marketing support. So I think it sort of depends upon what product category and what market scale we're talking, but I think both both are needed to sort of see the landscape stay in agriculture and the product innovation and diversification that Vermont so well known for to continue to grow in an ag and food sector. Okay. Okay, so, so what we had planned for sort of this next yeah. section, if, if it suits you, is there's three different sections and categories of brief presentations. Yeah. The first three sort of generally representing kind of like our backbone of agriculture in Vermont. Um, not that other sectors of agriculture aren't equally important, mm -hmm. but to have dairy, maple, and produce highlighted as our backbone industries. Yeah. And then the support structure that's critical for those industries to be successful, which is the you know, succession planning and business assistance, as well as the access to capital and um, the market development and product procurement example through Farm to School. And then looking at where there is additional research and development opportunity and diversification possibilities in the hemp and the beef and um, the goat industries. So. You have some of the best and brightest here to share as they contributed to the briefs as mostly lead authors or, in some cases, contributors. So our thought was that the three could come up in the section. We're going to try to keep them to five minutes, and so yeah. Kyle's going to be our timekeeper, not because they don't have more to say than five minutes, but to allow us to kind of cut through Get the content. The and, then, and then you have a robust period of time for question and answer that could be those three individuals or Ellen and I or any of the folks in the room that might have also been contributors if you're open to hearing from, from the group. 
Sounds good. Sounds, Sounds good. like a plan. And then Ellen and I can come back up and tell us, tell you where we go from here. Yep. So, so would you like Laura to come up first? So Laura, Mark, and Will. Well, Welcome everybody. Yeah. Welcome, and we're glad you're here, and we're uh, glad you're here. Laura, do you want to kick it off? Sure. Your name is on the list first, so. Should, do I also need to introduce myself? Sure, why don't you introduce yourself? Okay. Thanks. Uh, I'm Laura Ginsberg. I work for the Agency of Agriculture, Food, and Markets as the Section Chief for the Agriculture Development Division. And I'm here today to talk about the Dairy Brief, in which I was the lead off author with a robust group of contributors, some of whom are here today. All right, thank you. So many people in this state and across the country think that the dairy sector is experiencing an irreversible downward spiral. Even USDA Secretary Purdue said that in America, the big get bigger and the small go out. The fact that we are here today, I believe, speaks to the fact that many of us respectfully disagree. The author, Malcolm Gladwell, in his book, David and Goliath, discusses the power of the underdog, of the player most would bet against given perceived disadvantages. Gladwell's argument is to, and I quote, look at the shepherd and the giant and understand where power and advantage really lie. It matters in a hundred specific and practical ways. It shapes the way we understand creativity and entrepreneurship and the way the oppressed seek to take on bullies and tyrants. We aren't very good at confronting these lessons about power. Understanding the power of the underdog requires an effort. It requires standing up to conventional wisdom. I believe that all of the recent movement in Vermont's dairy sector shows that we are poised to be a successful underdog. This dairy brief and the ideas it brings forward the selection of Vermont as one of three national dairy innovation centers, the enthusiasm and attendance of the Northern Tier Dairy Summit, and all of the positive energy and involvement from Vermont dairy farmers tells me that we're heading in the right direction. This is not to discount the emotional and financial pain that many in our dairy sector currently face, but I believe if that becomes our narrative, if we let settle the thought that only the big farms will last, then we have not been dogged enough in our work. And so you will see in the dairy brief, which begins on page 19, ideas and recommendations that are unconventional. As the national industry continues to move towards large farms, Vermont has an opportunity to refocus on small farms, particularly important since 43% milk fewer than 50 cows. This is unusual for the rest of the nation, but common in our region. Small farms compete on the market differently than larger farms and generally have the ability to be more flexible with production systems. Smaller farms often can more easily meet the needs of specialty processors, such as those looking for milk produced without fermented feed. Our proximity to large markets, capacity to process milk, and perception domestically and internationally as a producer of high quality products means that we are well positioned to take advantage of ever-changing consumer trends without drastically changing the way the sector operates. The continued growth of dairy processors and recent market research continue to show that there is room for additional value-added products. <coughs> Vermont grows an incredible diversity of forces that are well-suited to dairy. By providing additional technical assistance, there is room to grow the number of farms who utilize a grass-fed model, both for conventional and organic farms. This can have multiple benefits, such as lowering the cost of production and improving consumers' perception of dairy. Considering other models for milk pricing, such as components-based pricing or production strategies like seasonal milking, are other possibilities that can affect change within the system as it currently exists. By valuing the decades of knowledge and experience a retiring farmer has, creating intentional space for farmers to learn from each other, and incentivizing the next generation and incentivizing the next generation to move here to start a farm, we can create a cycle that's positive for development of the sector. Through the re-diversification of production strategies and the growth of value-added processing, we can grow the number of consumers who choose Vermont dairy first. 
These ideas and many others are outlined in the brief and through the work of the Agency of Agriculture. Thank you for your time today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Well, or how are we guys? Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Mark Canella, University of Vermont Extension, uh, Associate Professor of Extension with a, with a focus in farm business management and applied economics. Pleased to be here and um, pleased to share uh, the work I've been doing with Maple Industry and what we've come to find through the, the process of this brief. Uh, it was a great process. I actually got to work with uh, industry leaders, uh, both leaders of the Vermont Sugar Makers Association, leading equipment manufacturers, um, leaders in distribution and uh, bulk syrup buying and packaging, as well as some producers themselves, um, a mid-scale producer and also a larger scale producer that's doing their own marketing and, and moving syrup throughout this country. Um, I'm just going to take you through the highlights of the brief. You've got them in front of you, so I encourage you to look along and um, certainly ask questions now or later. So, what page are you on? Page 35. Page 35. I'm on my page. Yeah. <laughs> you mean this wasn't, this wasn't on the top? They <laughs> very um, So, Vermont maples has been rapidly growing. I'm sure a lot of you are aware of this. I think Vermont has a lot of cachet and a lot of a lot of branding that's carried through over the century. Um, but the past 15 to 20 years has been dramatic and rapid growth in the Vermont maple industry. Um, so I think I'd like to share with you some highlights to, to recognize that growth, um, to recognize the opportunity for continued national leadership coming from Vermont in different forms. Um, to consider the investments that are needed to maintain that leadership role, especially with the growing industry. I think we need to not be complacent and assume that we'll have leadership. I think there'll need to be investments and partnerships to, to maintain that with a growing footprint. Um, and also to initiate an awareness of the issues that are going to need to be addressed, um, not to manage what we've got, I think, but to position for where we will be in 10, 15, and 20 years. Um, and I'm pleased to work with a lot of maple producers that, that have that level of foresight to, to kind of think about where we're going to be and, and um, to position for it. So um, the growth is clear. There's a couple charts there. Um, I think you should just be aware that production has been growing at a, at a clip of 10 to 15 percent annually in the state of Vermont. Uh, we're currently the national leader in maple production. Over 55 percent of the country syrup is produced here in the state of Vermont. Um, important to note that approximately 60% of the national U.S. syrup consumption is imported from Canada. Canadian syrup comes over the border and supplies over half of the United States domestic consumption. Um, but still within the United States, we're, 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 leading, we're leading the show. Um, market growth has been dramatic, upwards of 8 to 10% growth annually. Um, you know, that's, that's like almost doubling in industry every decade. Um, it's softened a little bit, but we're still feeling like 6 to 8% growth is what we're hearing from the marketers, um, which is strong. And, um, well, I don't know if it's strong enough, but I think the emphasis of this brief is very much about continuing to market. So um, I'll highlight, highlight some of the bottlenecks and gaps and then a, a couple of the opportunities and recommendations. Um, some of the bottlenecks, a tight labor market. This isn't new for agriculture, but it's certainly something that we're aware of, especially with an industry that's growing. We're not looking to retain businesses. We're looking to provide employment opportunities for people coming to the state and to the businesses that have positioning to grow in the market. Um, there's some data limitations um, and statistical limitations. It's good for you all to know that they, everyone assumes that the Vermont and national statistics are probably 20 to 30% underreported at least. So when we say this is a $60 million farm gate sales industry, it could be $90 million in the state of Vermont. It's, it's not quite clear. Um, so more data would be helpful, or, or more accurate data. Um, and then a couple of the uncertainties. Um, climate change, um, demographic of farmers. These are not necessarily specific to maple, but things that we're aware of. OK, a couple of the opportunities. Um, and I, and I want to emphasize that there's a huge private motivation and huge private success pushing forward the maple industry. So I think a lot of the emphasis on marketing is the assumption that the private firms are really working hard and continue to work hard to pull syrup from our state and to get it out the door to the, to the known buyers. 
but we know that there, there's um, a nudge that's needed. So it's clear that maple is really positioned as a natural sweetener, um, a plant-based and, and minimally processed sweetener, which is, is going to serve really well in the national market sphere. Um, but more promotion will be necessary, both for Vermont and domestic syrup. There's opportunities in ingredient markets, there's opportunities for pure Vermont syrup, and Abby, I think, mentioned quite well, there's opportunities for product de to development. And this product is development at scale. It's not just innovation and niche marketing from producers, but it's scale-based processing and, uh, and packaging that can move the product out. So we'd like to see more pulling of that syrup through market initiatives. Um, and then I'll scan down to some of the recommendations where I think the public good is a little more clearly at stake, and I think where your roles may be a little more um, obvious. Um, the the public-private marketing initiatives will have to be partnerships. We've got, we've got large scale and mid-scale and small scale private entrepreneurs looking to market their syrup, but they're gonna need support. Um, and I think that's something to be aware of. We can't really clarify or quantify the investment there. I think that's gonna be a great partnership and task force that'll, that will happen in the near future. Um, but I think what is important is to recognize that with the growth of the industry, things like retail inspections, quality standards, uh, things of that nature that are really branding at its purest by maintaining a high quality product need to be invested in and probably expanded in investment. Um, I think there's great dialogue right now between the Agency of Agriculture, the Vermont, Vermont Maple Sugar Makers, and UVM Extension about where these will be verification programs versus educational programs. And you can see in the brief that it's clearly called out. Um, and staying on the topic of grading and, and quality, I think it's important to recognize uh, the Vermont Sugar House Certification Program. Uh, we do stand as a leader in production, and there's an opportunity right now in the national space to lead the way in food safety for maple production. Uh, the consumers are wanting it, the marketplace is wanting it, and there's an opportunity for Vermont to, to stand forward and say, we're gonna pre create the prescriptions and the protocols for safe sugar houses, and that, we think, is gonna be a huge consumer attribute that will help, again, move that syrup out to, um, to consumers. Um, I will just mention briefly the workforce development, which is already mentioned, and um, continued research, climate change, and uh, changes in market factors, certainly on our minds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Will Stevens. Uh, my wife, and Judy, and I own and operate Golden Russet Farm, certified organic vegetable farm, and Representative Norris's hometown of Shoreham. I'm glad to be here and <coughs> glad to be on this side of the table. Um, full disclosure, uh, I'm also uh, chair of uh, Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund, but um, I'm here today uh, uh, in my capacity as a grower, as a vegetable grower, um, who worked with Vern on the brief. Um, Vern couldn't be here today, so I'm pinch hitting, give it the best I can, I can give for you. Um, <clears throat> I thought I'd start with a, a few little fun facts uh, from, from my perspective. Um, there are more vegetable farms in Vermont right now than there are dairies. And I suspect, um, based on what I heard last year, there might be more acreage planted to hemp uh, than there were to vegetables. Um, the farms, uh, vegetable farms are, uh, in my opinion, community, not commodity oriented. Uh, they're fairly diverse. Most of the vegetable farmers have uh, diverse income streams. It's not strictly vegetables. Byrne pointed that out in the brief. Uh, some of them are carpenters, some of them are lieutenant governors. Um, you know, uh, it's all over the place. Um, their business model often incorporates more than transactional economic capital. Uh, it also includes social, personal, and community capital. And in that regard, it reminds me of the farms of the 30s and 40s in this state, um, which is something that um, if we were born here, we appreciate. If we moved here, some of us kind of want to perpetuate to some extent. But the big difference um, between the farms of then and the farms today are uh, the marketing opportunities that exist today. And um, uh, in my opinion, it's a, both a blessing and a curse. And what I mean by that, it's a blessing in that farmers play active roles in their communities uh, that tend to support rural institutions that keep our rural communities strong. They're independent entrepreneurs. They're price setters. They have some control over their market and ability to market. Um, and um, these relationally based businesses uh, are quite common in Vermont culturally. We're used to this type of a, a business model. 
And uh, that in turn supports the success of things like farmers markets, CSAs, farmer school programs, uh, gleaning efforts, things like that. The curse aspect of it, uh, our low population and economic demographics limit opportunities. Uh, market cannibalization is more likely now than it was uh, when we got started. Um, and I guess I should back up a little bit and say that my wife and I got started in 1981. Uh, thank you. No, you weren't born then yet, Senator. <laughs> <laughs> it's, been a long, it's been a long time. <laughs> what do you want, Will? <laughs> Uh, so, but, but cannibalization, what I mean by that is that um, existing markets, there are uh, folks that are kind of waiting for folks like me to get out of the way so they can take that market over. Or through price competition, they will take the market that we have, um, as opposed to developing new markets. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into developing and maintaining these markets, and I can, I can tell you all about that, including uh, what a lot of folks are doing, and Vern mentioned, uh, looking out of state for markets. Um, and then independence can also sometimes work against collaborative efforts uh, to float all boats, but in large part, thanks to, I think, Ellen's efforts with Farm to Plate, uh, you know, networks have formed and uh, there is a culture of collaboration now that, that works um, to the benefit of all. So um, what keeps me up at night as a grower, producer, uh, one who's in the process of transitioning our farm to our daughter, um, the future of Vermont agriculture and its relevance to our rural communities. Um, two dozen growers, roughly, account for as much as a third, maybe more, of the total vegetable farm revenues. And they're boomers, baby boomers. And this is where we can all say, okay, boomer. Um, <laughs> their active involvement will be over in the next 10 or 20 years. So what is that gonna look like? The businesses they run today look very different than the ones that they started in the 70s and 80s. And I can tell you more about that if you wanna hear about it. Um, and significantly, the conditions for today's next generation are very different than when we got started um, back in the early 80s. Uh, there's no guarantee that there's going to be a clean, smooth, successful transition of these farm operations to the next generation. Uh, our farm is actively involved through the Farm Viability Program, working with a consultant to ensure that that will happen. We're lucky. Um, not everyone has that, although everybody could, um, but uh, there's, a, there's no culture of that in the vegetable farm community the way there is in the dairy community. You know, there, there are very few vegetable farmers that are second generation farmers, much less third, fourth, fifth, or eighth, okay? Um, second thing, a lot of us do this out of a sense of passion, not economics. When we got into it, it was more philosophically based. It wasn't because we had this amazing business plan that was gonna guarantee profits. Uh, that wasn't a part of it at all, and that to some extent is true today, although I gotta say, the young, young entrepreneurs that are getting into it today are amazing. Um, but that's something, that's, that isn't something that should be ignored or minimized, but respected and honored, okay? Um, it's a positive personal characteristic. Um, since vegetable farms are diverse operations, farmers presumably have a variety of career options. So in, in some ways, um, it's just that one more thing that could cause them to say, uh, I'll go pound nails for a living, or run for governor, or who, you know, who knows, okay? Um, so uh, passion and commitment can, to a cause can only carry us so far. It's reasonable to assume that someday we should also be able to re realize a return on our investment. You know, it's nice to be driven by all these morally uh, you know, righteous things, but we need to make a profit at the end of the day. Um, so I bring that up because um, there are potential mines and barriers uh, to the path of fulfillment um, that could discourage folks, and some of these include um, policies that are unfriendly to farm and food security, uh, regulations that focus more on compliance than best practices, lack of profitability or perceived uh, or lack of a perceived pathway to profits, lack of adequate, affordable, and skilled labor, access to reliable markets and support systems and services that meet farmers where they are because they recognize and are equipped to meet their needs. Wrap it up. Okay. <laughs> so um, I'll skip right to two comments on Vern's rec on the recommendations. Um, the second recommendation to hire a highly skilled farm transfer service provider, I kind of see that, I'd like to expand that a little more to say let's create an accountable care approach to this and build a team of support 
around um, farms that, that need this um, next step, whether it's business development, product development, whether it's transition success, or whatever it might be. We're working with a consultant through farm viability. That's great. You know, it's possible that there are economists and soil scientists and others who could kind of do that work as well to ensure a successful transition. And the second to last um, recommendation, uh, again, I would uh, implore you to listen to the growers' needs and, uh, and, and enlist all, think integratively, enlist all of the service providers that are out there because they all have something to offer that's unique and, and helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have till 1045 for questions. So um, I guess. Anthony's hand is David, you got a question? Sure. I guess it's, I have two questions that are related. I know there's efforts to bring Vermont produce into Boston and other metropolitan areas. There's Farmers to You, I think, is one. And I'm just wondering whether you see that as a, something we should focus on relative to you know the focus on local markets, which I know it's, they're, they're both important. Do you see one better than the other, one more potential than the other? Yeah, thank you, Senator Polina. I think that I think they're both important. I think it's an and, not an either okay. situation, because um, in some ways, um, we need to look to export product. Um, the um, uh, I won't say we're in a, I would never say we're in a surplus vegetable situation, but access to markets and the way people shop and convenience are a lot of factors that prevent uh, Vermonters from getting Vermont produce. And so um, we can put a lot of energy into that and moving the dial a little bit, or an, an easier path might be to export product through, again, relationally based models like Farmers to You and, and you know, these CSA things. So when we talk about these out of state markets, um, does that ever give it, if you, do you see that as providing a temptation to go more towards a monoculture of sorts? Not exactly a monoculture, but you grow a variety of things now, but yes. if you knew that Boston just wanted apples, or no, that's not a good example, but broccoli, cauliflower, would you be tempted to then maybe become less diversified? Is that a problem? Becoming less diversified, in my experience as a grower, um, has created problems right. um, uh, in terms of disease and pest issues. Right, that's, what, that's but, what that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, but the thing is, I guess, I guess, uh, one way I'll interpret your question is, um, if we, if the vegetable uh, farmers move toward more towards a commodity model of agriculture, which right. very few are right now. Um, would that be a detriment? Uh, I, I don't know that that's likely to happen. Um, if there's an opportunity, mean, frankly, a lot of us are mercenaries. You know, we'll grow for a market. If a market is there, we'll, we'll see if we can provide it. Um, but um, I think right now, the culture, as I understand in Vermont, knowing a number of growers personally and so forth, um, they're aware of the, of the trap of monoculture or moving towards less diverse crop mix and so forth because if nothing else you're just putting yourself at risk you know through one hailstorm or whatever it is it's nice to have yeah a, a mix of crops so I, i'm not too worried about that personally and and on them on that same line do we have um you take fresh vegetables, but what about if you wanted to do the winter months and do we have processing and cooling and, and quick freeze and all that available to our farmers that want to go that yeah, way? Yeah, there, there are some, uh, there's some of that. Uh, years ago, the state had the quick freeze trailer. Um, that's now in, in private hands not being used very much. Um, a, a lot of that, again, is determined by the market, which isn't strong for it. And uh, I know some folks down our way uh, used it for a while to try to create a market for frozen corn and different things like that, but it was pretty expensive to do. The price point in the store was too high. Yeah. Yeah, so it didn't work. Questions all right here? No. Yeah. John? Uh, I had a sort of big picture question. Um, thinking about Roger Albee and what he wrote about um, Vermont. It seems like Vermont's always been dominated by one, one big agricultural product. And it was, you know, maybe starting out with sheep and then maybe hops. And, and for a long time, it's been dairy. Uh, so I wanted to know if, as authors and co authors, in the next 25 years, do you see it continue to be dominated by dairy or dominated by maybe maple or something else? Or 
oxymoronic and maybe will be dominated by diversity. <laughs> Just what is, what is the, the, the big dominant agriculture in the next 25 years? <laughs> I'll take a stab. Sure. Um, yeah. I think the ideal is to be moving towards more of a blended portfolio. I think we're all recognizing the risk of being dairy dominant. Not that it hasn't been good, but it, but it, it puts us at risk. So I think, I think the intention is to move towards a more diversified portfolio of agricultural products. And maple is on that fringe of forest products, so I think also embracing you know, perpetual forest cover and timber and non-timber species in our woodlands might be a way to diversify that portfolio so we don't explicitly think of open field agriculture. Um, maple is an example. I mean, the industry has doubled in 10 years. It's slated to double in 10 more. So 30 million to 60 million to 120 million. Sooner, you know, soon that's going to be 15 to 20 percent of the portfolio. <coughs> Um, I wouldn't discredit the presence of the dairy industry. I think it's been a great source of cash flow and regular cash throw, flow through rural communities. But we know the number of participants in the dairy industry will continue to decline. The businesses will evolve and change, but the actual business owner numbers will drop down. And so I think, I think what we've all been waiting for with Farm to Plate, honestly, is for these other niche or budding or nascent industries to say, we can move past proof of concept to scale. And the concept of exporting our product to other states isn't just sort of a maybe a sellout to mechanization and monoculture, but to say we can put high quality products out efficiently to be cost competitive with other players in different states. So I think the there's an opportunity for that, but I think we're still waiting to figure out what's the targeted investment and the private side push to see these new ideas go from just niches and kind of tourist stops to you know anchors in the marketplace. Um, and I don't think we have the clear answer yet. You yeah. mentioned hemp. I mean, I think we're all trying to learn how to develop new industries and bring them up to a better, to, to, to diversify. And I, I would add to that that in 10 or 15 years, the dairy landscape is going to look different. Right now, it's generally pitched as being negative, but I think there's real opportunity in that there there is going to be transitions between older farm owners to younger generations in the family, to brand new farmers, next generation from out of state that move here to be dairy farmers, and how we address the challenges today will determine how much of a factor dairy is in the future. I think it's always going to be there. Whether or not it's the largest source of the agricultural economy as it has been for years and years. Um, you never know because dairy pricing is so based on international market trends that we have no control over. So if the number of farms decrease and the price of milk decreases, then that just decreases net farm returns, which can impact its standing in the overall ranking. Um, so I think there's the way that you, just like any statistic, you know, the way that you look at the number can have the impact on it. But I think dairy is here to stay, and it's going to look different, and that's okay. <clears throat> the, the big issue with dairy is the pricing. I mean, we know how to do it. Our people know how to do it. They enjoy doing it. <clears throat> but hooked to a, a plan of pricing that was put together back in the 1930s in the 2020 age is, is not working and, and uh, it's not acceptable, but it's a federal pricing thing uh, that just isn't working. Uh, Vern, uh, would you like to head up the crew to uh, have sugar houses uh, licensed or on a list? Yeah, I'm Mark. It's Mark. Yeah, Mark Burns. Uh, Mark. <laughs> uh, I'm not Burns. <laughs> yeah, I know you are. Yeah, I'm not Burns. Well, in, 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 in my role, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be best fit to, ha to head up the certification because it would be regulatory and it would be some sort of audit process, whether it's volunteer. The, the Vermont Maple Sugar Makers have, have made an attempt to start a program, <laughs> and they're excited to maintain that role. It could be a great actual way for them as an association to maintain value to their community members. The demographic of the Sugar Makers <laughs> Associations are changing, and, and you, know, you might see this with different industries. The younger generation is coming in, and they're coming in with different perspectives. They're not necessarily joining membership associations and going to banquets. 
like some of the, the current generations of owners do. Um, and so the Sugar Makers Association is looking for ways to maintain relevance. And I think they've demonstrated actually with the um, sugar added labeling of campaigns, if you've been familiar with that, with the, the food, US Food and Drug Administration. Huge lobbying effort and coordinating effort from the Sugar Makers Association to represent the body of producers and to have an impact on legislation. Um, I think there's an opportunity there for the certification program as well. But the capacity, honestly, is, um, is limited. And so more capacity is needed to maintain a program like that. See, we tried that maybe eight, 10 years ago, trying to get the sugar houses you know, registered so we knew where they were, at least. And well, it wasn't very pleasant uh, <laughs> trying to pass that. So. Well, I, I mean, I, I think I'll be honest with you. I've just done a survey of Northeast maple producers, and we found that maybe 70 to 80 percent of the crop is actually produced by 8 to 10 percent of the of the producers. Not very different than maybe dairy consolidation. Uh, so you, you'll have a lot of grumbling about people wanting to be off the record and maybe not pay taxes, and maybe they'll volunteer to not take support programs publicly as well. Um, but I think the producers. That in it, the producers that are in it from a business perspective are they're recognizing the need, they're recognizing the, the benefits of participating in a marketplace that's accountable, transparent, and verifiable. And uh, I think, like, like Will said, they'll, they'll produce for a market. And if the market shows it's important, they'll get on board. Other questions? Yes. Um, so I have two questions. Sorry, Will, I don't have a question for you, but I will say that Will has some of the best vegetables in Addison County. They're awesome. In the world. Um, in the world, yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, Boy, your world's pretty small. My world yes, is small. Yeah. The <laughs> county's <laughs> awesome. There are many growers in Addison um, But I have, I have a question for about maple and dairy, and the maple question is we have uh, Obviously, climate change is a big conversation and a big focus of uh, ours in this building, I hope. And I know we hear a lot about climate change. You alluded to it, but didn't go in depth about the impact of climate change on the maple industry. Um, I had the pleasure of serving on a, a, a task force about um, forest carbon sequestration. And it, it occurred to me that we didn't talk too much about maple in that. And I'm wondering what impact you've seen <laughs> There has been a loss of acreage and for, uh, forested land in Vermont, even though the, the vast majority of our land is forested in the state. And I'm wondering, is the loss of acreage impacting the industry? Is there a need to conserve forest land that's specific to maple? How does it integrate into the sort of forest economy at large and the other things that we do and need to do with our forests? Yeah, awesome. Is that a specific enough question? Or? <laughs> it's a pretty big question, but I'll I know give it's a big specific. question, but like yeah. just thinking about the yeah. health of our forests. So I think in general, um, the forestry community is certainly aware of the implications of climate change, but also not really ready to pass judgment. There's been research that's come out from multiple institutions, and a lot of people have had concerns about the research and um, thought that maybe it, it might be a little alarmist on the the potential threats to maple forests from a time scale perspective. So I think a lot of people recognize that climate change needs to be considered, um, but I, I think it's gonna be a long process that's gonna be drawn out to understand the true impact. These are long-term species, these maple trees, so we think they're resilient, and it's gonna take a while to see the kind of the symptoms or the impacts. Um, from a conservation standpoint, I think that could be a judgment call on you know, who maybe wants to support um, the working landscape or a forested landscape. The estimate right now is that maybe eight to 10% of the maple resource in Vermont is currently tapped for production. So the idea is that that doesn't mean there's still 80 or 90% that's tappable because of accessibility issues, but I think the general idea is there still is good maple woods out there um, that could support the growth. Um, I haven't heard a lot of concerns on a macro scale of loss of forested land impacting maple, um, but I do think it'll be more competitive, especially in specific regions. Um, and then back just to forest uh, carbon sequestration, I think that's just another one of those great attributes that the maple industry has. You know, perennial hardwood cover for water quality, soil retention, and then you, you, know, you stack on carbon sequestration. And it, it, it could be an asset there that's just that's building up over time if we maintain the woods. Mm -hmm. I, I, I see Ellen saying we need to move on, so I, can, I, I wanted to ask more about the small dairy farms that you brought up as a focus. And, 
maybe we can have a conversation in committee at sure. another time about that. So. Yep. So we'll move on and um, thank thank the three of you very much. Uh, <laughs> I just want to make sure this, this is a wrap up. This is a match. <laughs> so uh, welcome, folks. Uh, good to see you and uh, welcome. Uh, so I don't know which one wants to lead off, but Al, you want to get started and introduce yourself and and we'll go from there. Thank you. For the record, I'm Ella Chapin of the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, where I run the Vermont Farm and Forest Viability Program. Nice to see you all today. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna find myself and keep my eye on the uh, You've heard a lot about uh, how many challenges there are right now facing agriculture and how uh, what a major transition our agricultural industry is in. So I'm not going to repeat that, but it's something that I think about and talk about a lot in my work. Um, this is just simply a very difficult time to be an agricultural producer. Uh, and not just in Vermont. I want to just say this while we're very much talking about Vermont today. I just want to say that these issues are not um, only here in Vermont. We're, we're talking with regional partners and national partners about many of the same issues you're hearing about today. Um, I'm going to just run through some of the barriers that are more business oriented because I'm here to talk with you a little bit about land access, succession, and general business assistance that's needed to support the agricultural sector in this transition. We have barriers um, around business viability, just uh, the market challenges, uh, competition challenges that were alluded to earlier, changing uh, markets and economic pressures. And um, one thing to just realize is that business owners, we have generally small businesses in Vermont, are family owned and operated, and many business owners are involved in the day-to-day -day of their business so much that it's very hard to think about uh, about the business, not just be in the business, and that is something that um, business coaches and, and business advisors can help um, and get business owners out of that day to day. Um, we see new markets and production models coming uh, here to Vermont that can require a higher level of business acumen and management skills uh, to identify and communicate with customers, new markets manage different kinds of operations. So we're seeing that need change as we see new markets, uh, our new production models. We see a lot of barriers around land access for new farmers. New business models often require less land or different infrastructure from the farms that um, are out there and available for rent or for purchase. Existing and old infrastructure as well as marginal land can be a huge barrier to successful tra farm transition to new owners and um, you'll see more details about that in the report. And then um, also potential farm successors often don't have the skill set or the financial position to assume management or ownership of an existing farm operation. So the way Will was describing so the evolution of farm businesses over time, and some of them are uh, particularly uh, larger or sophisticated operations with certain kinds of markets, and it's not every new farmer's um, or every interested beginning farmer's ability to step into some of those land bases. Additionally, we have issues um, where retiring farmers struggle to have sufficient retirement income, housing options. Someone might want to leave their land and, uh, and find a successor, but they're not ready to leave their home, and the challenges to land uh, access and succession that that causes. Um, and then just from the business assistance side, we have lots of great business advisors through the viability program and other, and UVM extension and other networks. Uh, but we don't have as many of them as we'd like. They're not easy to hire for. It's a very um, extensive skill set. So we need to build out our business network at the same time and provide professional development training in that regard. Um, I want to say that Vermonters through state investments and otherwise have heavily invested in nationally renowned programs and institutions that provide really effective business, technical, and financial support and tools to our agricultural system. I just want to get that on the record. We, you, collectively as a state through private contributions and state investment and with national support, uh, we have a lot of really great in, uh, institutions and tools. We have the viability network. Uh, many viability partners and organizations that are part of that. We have UVM Extension, the Vermont Land Trust and their Farmland Access Program, Vita VAC, uh, we, we Live, 
Farm First and Ag Mediation are two programs that um, you've uh, contributed to, particularly Farm First. Um, and th that set of, uh, and, and there's others, that, that set of support systems is really important and that's what some of the sections that I helped write in this plan are about. And they both need to be continued to be supported. They need to evolve and adapt as farm businesses evolve and adapt. And uh, we're talking a lot about that sort of increase in FTEs and, the, and the, we need more of a lot of that work to happen on the ground. Um, for example, uh, we expect about three times the number of farm uh, successions to new owners in the next, uh, uh, in the next uh, 10 years than we've seen in the last 10, and that requires a tripling of resources to do so. Um, I want to just leave you with, between sort of our innovative farm and food entrepreneurs that are out there, the history of our strong Vermont brand, and the excellent support systems that we have, but we need to keep investing in, we have the potential to see an amazing renaissance of the ag sector. Um, with new business models, new models of land ownership that need to be invested in, um, new marketing and distribution. <coughs> a lot of the things that you've done today. Um, good morning, for the record, my name is Janice St. Ange, and I run the Flexible Capital Fund, which is a private mission-focused investment fund that offers an alternative to equity investment in Vermont's food system, forestry, and clean energy market sectors. So I'm here to talk about money. We all need it, businesses need it to grow, uh, and it's one of those inputs uh, along with the business advisory services that Ella just talked about that's critical for our food system businesses in order to uh, not only um, grow but stay here in Vermont. Um, I want to draw your attention to the eye chart. I believe you all have a copy of the um, financing inventory with the capital continuum, this little eye chart right here. Um, page 73. Page 73. This is a capital continuum which is an effort to just show visually the variety of types of capital that are available here in Vermont and actually um, more broadly in New England to support food system businesses. And the reason it's on a continuum is it's really from low risk type of capital like bank debt all the way up to high risk type of capital like equity investment from angel investors and venture capital firms that are based here in Vermont. Um, when we first started uh, the Farm to Plate uh, initiative back 10 years ago, this eye chart was a, a little bit, um, was a lot emptier. Uh, since over the last 10 years, uh, a lot has evolved in terms of new players coming into the market, which I think has been a very positive thing for food system businesses and farmland businesses. Different structures of capital uh, and different players, also folks coming from outside of Vermont interested in Vermont food system businesses. So those are all very positive things. Um, I also wanted to mention this idea, and we talked a little bit about it in the brief, that businesses uh, in the food system need all kinds of capital. And oftentimes they need more than one kind of capital, this integrative capital approach, where they may need debt to finance a piece of equipment. They may, may, may need equity or someone investing uh, in the business for an ownership stake in order to grow the business because their cash flow is tight and they, don't, they need a structure where they don't have to repay for a period of time. Grants are an, a really, really important type of capital that is very rare, as we all know, in this state. And I can't emphasize enough the importance of the Working Lands Enterprise Fund and, and the type of money that that um, program offers to food system businesses. If you had to say, well, where are the gaps then? I would say we have a, a, a good supply of low cost debt, great providers out there providing debt to finance uh, businesses that have assets, that have equipment and real estate. Um, the gaps really seem to be around patient, what I'll call patient equity, alternative structures like investing um, ownership in a business uh, that is going to take some time to then either have an exit strategy or someone um, will buy that equity back, as well as land financing. I think we all know um, that alternative and creative land financing models are few and far between, although there have been some that have evolved, and um, we're also hearing about the Vermont Land Trust and the work they're doing in providing financing for land, and that's an, a very important piece. Um, on the supply side, I, I want to talk briefly that there's supply and demand. 
So the demand for capital is from our food system businesses, but the supply side impacts the type of money that they can get as well. We have a very homogenous um, investment community here in Vermont, and um, my hope is that over the next five to seven years, we'll see that change from the standpoint of bringing diversity into the picture beyond white men investing and bringing more young generation millennials coming into play to invest in our food system businesses, um, more women. We started a Vermont Women's Investors Network. So those types of activities need to, um, need to increase in order to bring diversity into different innovative models of financing here in Vermont. Um, and I guess the last thing I will say is it's not just about the money. Ella talked about the business advisory capacity. Money is an important fuel to, um, to grow companies, but they need social and human capital as well and that human capital in terms of advisory capacity, as well as social capital and the networks that they can access outside of Vermont to help them grow. Uh, I will leave you with the two recommendations that this brief um, does talk about, including and in continuing to invest uh, at least a million and a half annually into the Working Lands Enterprise Fund. Again, grant funds are so unique and so tremendously valuable and help those companies leverage other types of capital. And then really thinking through this idea that there might be an opportunity to create a loan loss reserve fund for those types of companies that don't have collateral but do and, and are, do need debt to finance their growth. Um, so having some kind of uh, study to talk, to figure out if that might be an option. Thanks, Janice. Uh, Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Betsy Rosenluth. I'm the project director of Vermont Feed, a partnership with Shelburne Farms in Nofa, Vermont, and coordinator of the Vermont Farm to School Network. And I'm here to highlight a few items on the school food procurement brief that was uh, lead author by Abby Nelson at Nofa, who's since retired. But we're excited that Helen Rourke, who's here, has taken her place at Nofa. Um, and obviously these briefs are all very related and connected, and I just want to highlight um, the importance of raising the next generation of consumers who are loyal to Vermont products, understand what real maple syrup tastes like, um, or a Vermont tomato, um, and the potential careers in food and agriculture. Um, Can we just find out page what page? 47, one? sorry. So schools spend $15.5 million each year buying food. About a third of our schools self-identified as purchasing over 20% from local producers. About 49% um, in a survey done by the Department of Health stated they intend to increase that amount. And we want a greater share of that $15.5 million to stay in the Vermont economy and with Vermont producers. If we reach the goal that was set last year um, by your committees of 20% local purchasing by schools, that would mean about $3 million annually going to Vermont producers or almost $5 million contributed to Vermont's economy. So school purchasing alone isn't going to save Vermont farms, but it's really a stable market, consistent market, and a vital part of the whole mix. Uh, the survey by the Department of Health also, in, this was in 2016, also showed that the top concerns to schools for purchasing local food were cost, reliable supply, and delivery and storage considerations. So the buying and serving of local food can require more storage, equipment, training of staff, and schools generally don't prioritize that investment. School meals, as you probably know, are expected to raise all the money they need by selling school meals. And the re meal reimbursements have not really kept pace with the cost of meals. And school procurement has complicated federal rules, which prompts many schools to go with a large distributor over local suppliers, and the resistance to managing purchasing relationships with um, multiple farm partners. It takes additional work. So opportunities, I think there's a theme we're hearing this morning that we've had some strong training and technical assistance programs that have assisted farmers with bidding on school contracts or working with school procurement um, criteria. 
uh, programs that have assisted school nutrition programs with everything from bidding to forward contracting with producers to uh, just finding local sources to training staff to cook from scratch and things like that. Um, we are also working with producer associations on increasing uh, purchasing a particular product, uh, changing a strategy to go with maple in every school and working with the Sugar Makers Association, or our beef to school program working with the beef producers. Um, and the evidence shows that expanding school meal participation overall is translating into increasing local purchasing. Um, and we also have a network of food hubs who are providing a transparent supply chain of local product. Um, we will say that some of the results of consolidation in school districts have meant that, um, meant that there's an increase in volume because we're aggregating purchasing from multiple schools and that means they've become more interesting customers to some local farmers. So that's been um, a positive in some districts. Uh, last, I just want to highlight four recommendations. The first was to increase local purchasing with a per meal incentive to schools for buying Vermont products above a set threshold. So there was a bill introduced last week, S273. We want to thank Senators Hardy, Pearson, Starr, and Polina for uh, sponsoring that legislation. Um, and what we found in other states that have that, that there's been a significant increase in local purchasing. So we're very excited about that. Uh, second is to increase education and matchmaker events for buyers and producers. And third, to fully fund the Vermont Farm to School Grants Program with base funding at 500,000 to meet the demand for farm to school in every school. And last, um, support the expansion of universal meals, which increases participation in school meals, which again has translated to more local purchasing as there's less administrative burden and uh, school nutrition programs have used that time and money <coughs> to pursue purchasing. Um, Hunger Free Vermont found 64% of Vermont schools providing universal school meals reporting that it allowed them to increase their local purchasing. So there's a, a connection there. Thank you. Oh. Questions? Yeah. Um, questions from? Yeah, I have a quick question about the yeah. table here on 49. So it says fruit is purchased, there's a 49% next to fruit. Does that mean that <coughs> just under half our schools are buying local fruit, or does that mean our schools are buying <coughs> just under half of their fruit? See what I mean? Um. Oh, you guys put the chart together. Do you remember? That's sure. the, so that came from the Farm School Data Harvest method. Do you remember that? From ah, right. Okay. But that is the percent of schools that are purchasing some food okay. local. Okay. Right. Thank you. Unless that's the conversation. Yeah, that's the best. <clears throat> uh, other questions? Yes. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. All these reports are awesome. Uh, I just have a question about the universal school meals, and I, it's a big conversation. Yeah. It's something we do need to think about. But in, in some of your information on 48, where uh, under the bottlenecks and gaps, where it says the food costs are increasing faster than the federal and state meal reimbursement rates, mm -hmm. how would um, having a universal school lunch program help in regards to that aspect? Mm -hmm. How would that go together? Yeah, and we can get you far more detailed information, but in general, um, what we've seen in the schools that have moved to universal school meals, mm -hmm. that there's been um, an increase in participation, which improves the finances. It lessens the labor and cost of administering the program when you've been doing good. So you, they've been able to um, use that time and some of that labor yeah. and funding then to put towards other opportunities. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's like a whole drill down yeah. that we could get into and we'd be happy to do that with you with Hunger Free Vermont. I'd like to hear more about that. 
Yes. Did you? No. You haven't got you any other questions? How you? Um, thank, thank you very much. Would you like to introduce yourself? And I think, Nataka, you're supposed to uh, start off. Start things off. Do sure. We need, uh, yes, or can you give me a mic? Thank you. Um, my name is Nataka White. Thank you for having me here. Uh, it's good to see many of you again. Yeah. I'm the lead author in the Hemp Brief, and I'm here to introduce you uh, to some of the <coughs> issues raised in that. I also want to thank my contributing writers. Uh, this is the brief on him. The, uh, the, the still and current legal uh, varieties of cannabis in Vermont. <laughs> I've worn uh, many hats over the last uh, 26 years in the U.S. hemp industry. 24 of those have been uh, here in Vermont uh, as an entrepreneur, consultant, writer. Currently, I'm the uh, operations manager at Vermont Refrigerated Storage's hemp uh, storage uh, project. A brief historical perspective, very brief. Vermont uh, Hemp Program was established in 2014, so we're starting our seventh year of production. Three factors, I would say, have led uh, to Vermont's early success in hemp production. Uh, first, according to UVM research, uh, hemp is well adapted to Vermont's climate and thrives in the range of soil types that we have here. Uh, second, for over two decades, the Vermont legislature uh, has been very forward-thinking and progressive in, in its approach uh, to hemp. And those of us in the hemp industry are very grateful for that. And third, the Agency of Ag, uh, Agriculture has been exemplary in their administration of Vermont's hemp program. And I'll add a fourth, and that is that uh, Vermont growers, processors, and consumers of hemp are very passionate. Fast forward 2018, hemp sales uh, have grown in the U.S. to approximately $1.1 billion, and this is led by cannabidiol CBD, as many of you know, this mostly comes from the hemp flowers. Uh, following uh, in, in cannabidiol's footsteps, other uh, hemp products that are selling well on U.S. and global markets, personal care products from the oil, and this, which is from the seed, uh, food, nutritional food products from the seed and the oil, and industrial products from stalk, fiber, uh, they're used in building materials, textiles, biocomposites, and more. The name of the game in Vermont is cannabinoid production. Uh, there are over 100 cannabinoids uh, identified so far in the cannabis plant. Uh, most of them are non-psychoactive or non-intoxicating. And it's the careful cultivation and largely organic production of uh, hemp plants in Vermont and the care uh, with which these compounds make it to market uh, that is uh, one of the advantages of what we're doing compared to some of the large western states. Hemp-derived CBD is projected to be $2.6 billion industry within two years. It's a significant market that we're reaching into. 90% of Vermont hemp growers are growing for these cannabinoids. That still leaves about 100 other growers uh, growing for fiber, seed, uh, feed, and other, uh, other, other end uses. <clears throat> From 2016 to 2018, so commercial production, uh, research began in 2014, commercial production <laughs> state began in 2016, and in the consecutive two years, uh, the first Vermont farms and businesses that jumped in were richly rewarded uh, uh, for, get, for getting in early. We saw CBD uh, biomass that was to be extracted, selling for between $100 and $150 per pound. That could bring in net eighty to one hundred thirty thousand dollars per acre. These were real prices seen in 2018. This led to the hemp boom that we saw in 2019 and now there's an oversupply of high CBD hemp. Prices are falling nationally, globally uh, for hemp biomass and now we're seeing twenty five to fifty dollars uh, per pound. I will say that even at twenty dollars a pound under current uh, under current production methods and given very low yields uh, that could still be uh, bringing in a net of $5,000 an acre. There's, uh, let's see. So what we're lacking, I would say, uh, is high quality and consistent supply of hemp seed for the Northeast. Hemp genetics are uh, very regionally adaptive, and there are numerous issues, uh, both in compliance and in the vigor of the crop, 
that would be addressed by a, a hemp seed certification program, which could be led by, which should be led by the Agency of Agriculture in conjunction with UVM Extension. Uh, agricultural experience in hemp is lacking, uh, as is industry knowledge, access to markets, and the technical assistance needed to support informed business decisions. <coughs> So uh, drawing on a few of the recommendations uh, at the end of the brief, I would say investment in uh, both from the private and state, uh, state sectors, uh, particularly in uh, research uh, for new and innovative uh, products that could come from not just the cannabinoids, but also fiber, uh, food, and animal feed, but also uh, more education, uh, feasibility studies, and product um, innovation programs are all essential. Uh, we do need additional technical staff, 900 growers are out there, uh, most of them looking for help, most of them inexperienced in growing hemp. I should say many of them, not, it's probably more fair. Uh, we recommend two full-time uh, UVM extension positions to help support uh, this educational uh, effort that's needed. Uh, there's uh, quite a lot of room for um, equipment development, um, best practices, innovation, and, and improvements that will lower the operating costs for uh, bringing in uh, these crops. A statewide hemp trade association, uh, full disclosure, uh, I am helping to bring that uh, into fruition. Uh, it is in its formative stages. Uh, the intent is to serve as an information policy and education hub, a clearinghouse for hemp market data, uh, grow access to uh, national and global markets, and take the lead in promoting Vermont hemp products. Uh, we are, uh, will be seeking uh, state appropriation to help leverage private funds uh, to jumpstart uh, the association until it reaches, or while it's reaching for uh, operational self-sufficiency. As prices come down to earth, Vermont's hemp sector cannot look back. The, uh, the boom years are over, but there's still a long-term opportunity in farming uh, for cannabinoids. Uh, farmers need to adjust their business model to where prices are headed, improve, their production practices, which I've touched on, reduce waste, lower costs, and be proactive in the off-season, pursue alliance and alliances uh, in and outside of the state, and pursue new market opportunities. Thank you, <coughs> and, uh, We'll get questions okay. after the three presenters. Yeah. And Good. Yeah. Yeah. Good morning. Um, thank you for having me here today. I'm Adeline Jerk. I'm the president of Vermont Creamery. Um, we are cheese um, company, specialty cheese company located in Western Vermont and have been in business for 35 years. Um, today I'm going to talk about goats, um, the goat industry, and um, in speci specifically about dairy goats and also meat goats. Um, Earlier in this conversation, we spoke about um, the evolution of the dairy economy and the importance of dairy for our uh, agriculture landscape here in Vermont. And um, you know, uh, if we reflect of this hundreds of um, years of, of uh, tradition that we have in our state, is you know, dairy farmers came together with uh, milk and trying to um, come together to create value-added products to transform their milk and then uh, bring uh, this form of, um, of milk through butter, through cheese, to consumers. Uh, and now we see a lot of pressure in the cow dairy sector with commodity pricing, with also impact at the global level on, on how dairy farmers are going to operate and, and live um, throughout the, the rest of the years. I would frame that the good um, dairy industry is the opposite. We started as a cheesemaker with um, creating product that people didn't know they're going to love or, or want. Um, had to convince them to even try a little spoon of it. And really, over the past three decades, built demand for for goat cheese nationally, and it's through you know great brands uh, in Vermont, but also other brands in the Midwest and on the West Coast. And after 30 years of success in the marketplace and having finally consumer wanting to look at and um, try products like goat cheese, uh, now we have to go back and look at the supply chain and how do we leverage this market opportunity, this premium product. Um, and uh, take advantage of that demand to enhance the dairy landscape in Vermont. Um, additionally, we also see an opportunity for goat meats. 
um, one factor for you to know is 52% of the goat's meat consumed in the U.S. right now is imported from either um, New Zealand or Australia. So as we look at the gold um, industry as a whole, we see opportunity not only to enhance um, the goat's milk production in Vermont, but also take a really vertical approach into the supply chain and also put the goat meat on the map um, for Vermont. So a couple, um, couple opportunity that, that we see with, uh, with the goat farming model is um, we see dairy producer transitioning either um, transitioning out of dairy farming as a whole, um, or also looking to transition some of their assets to either their children or um, bring on diversification on their farm. And so farmers with assets, with uh, barns that now are empty, we are uh, looking to convince them to bring on goats. Uh, and bring on goats um, that will bring a premium price uh, into their operation. Uh, to give you an example, um, goat's milk price within the state uh, is paid at $50 per 100 weights compared to cow dairy price. So there is a significant um, premium for the milk because we're able to pass this on to consumer um, through great branding and outstanding quality product. The bottleneck that we have is um, the goat industry is a very young industry, only three, uh, uh, three decades old, and so there is a lack of expertise um, into goat dairy farming support, think of uh, vets, think of experts in goat nutrition, and I would say the biggest bottleneck right now is access to capital. Uh, with cow dairy producers that are um, looking to diversify, they do not have extra cash, they are already <coughs> in debt to perhaps invest in a milking parlor, invest in new pens, and buy a, a herd of, of goats anymore. So what we are recommending um, is in that order. The first is um, creating a, a financial support mechanism for a dairy producer who wants to diversify add on goats or transition, meaning you know, switch from cow to goats, uh, to buy a milking products, to buy animals, and also um, to transition their infrastructure. Number two, it's um, create a position, uh, perhaps at UVM Extension, to start telling the story that uh, to cow dairy producer to consider goats. Um, I know there is a long, long history of cow, not only in the state, but also in the country, um, and so it's about telling the story, not only of how to operate a goat dairy farm, but also how to build a sustainable, profitable business model. Usually, um, goat dairy producers are able to um, cash flow within 12 to 18 months, so it's a much faster model. Number three, we see the opportunity to really put Vermont on the map as the center of excellence for dairy goats. Um, right now, the um, California and UC Davis um, University has built uh, a lot of expertise in growth, genetics, nutrition. We are talking um, with Vermont Technical College to see if there is an opportunity to add on um, goat, um, goat uh, technical um, expertise um, into their program. And last but not least, we as we develop um, this industry, we need to think of um, the goat meat components of it and how do we um, help um, educate consumer and chef um, on Vermont goats and, and so we can also enhance this, uh, this part of the supply chain and, and inspire people to, to try and build meat. Thank you. Um, Sure. Good morning. Um, my name is Jennifer Foley. I'm with UVM Extension, the Center for Sustainable Agriculture. Um, my work is with grazing and livestock farms. I work with farmers all over the state, uh, from dairy to poultry, and um, am the lead off author on grass-fed beef. And grass-fed beef represents this tremendous opportunity nationally and locally. Um, if you look at the top line, oh, we're on page 31, before you ask. Um, Nationally, we've grown in a four-year period from a $17 million industry to a $272 million industry. 
in sales, not in Vermont nationally, but it represents the trajectory that grass-fed beef is, is seeing in terms of demand. Grass-fed is a little bit tricky. That is 100% grass-finished, all the way to raised for a large portion of its life and grain finished. And this um, brief is, a, is an attempt to address both different, yes, the, tr the, the combination of all of those things, some of the recommendations. So Vermont is really well positioned to um, address this, de this growing demand. We get water at different times of the year. More we have more water than many of the other um, beef producing areas of the country. We have, um, we grow grass really, really well. Um, we have far a long history of agriculture and beef farming here. Lots of dairy farmers have always kept a few beef cows as well. Um, and and we're starting to see that in Vermont as well. We've grown 37-ish percent um, in between the 2012 and the 2017 um, ag census years. It's starting to connect with each other. However, with this greater uh, demand also comes a greater amount of competition. International competition is a tremendous challenge outside of Vermont. Competition for, Ver for Vermont and the Northeast is also um, an incredible challenge too. The other, another piece is if you look at, um, if you look at the graphics on page 31, um, not only are we seeing a decline in terms of acres um, of grazing, grazable acreage, um, but we also see that 80% of the farms raising beef are not doing so in, um, and making a profit doing that. So we have this tremendous opportunity, and yet what's going to really encourage farmers to want to get into this industry if it doesn't look like they're going to make any money doing that? Um, I think there's been some really excellent points brought up by um, the predecessors uh, just saying if it's not profitable, we don't want to do it. So a complication also in beef for anything that's in uh, livestock agriculture is going to include genetics. It's going to include um, safety. Uh, it's going to include processing. Um, and in the context of beef processing, we're highly seasonable. That's one of the big challenges for us as well, not only in grazing, but also producing feed in the growing season to take us through um, the non-growing seasons. And the folks who are really good at that are the folks who are able to be more profitable. We make money when we graze. We raise money when we have to feed a stored feed. It's very expensive to do that. So the longer we can graze and the better we can graze, the more profitable we're likely to be. So I've talked about some of the bottlenecks and gaps. Um, one of the challenges is we do need better grazing management pra practices. We do need more acreage, but we can make so much more uh, beef and grass on the acreage that we have. Often, when we go to do technical assistance with a farm, we can double and sometimes more than double the amount of feed that they produce on their land just by doing what they do differently than they've traditionally done it. Um, Vermont has a very long history. It's one of our bottlenecks as well, and I love it too, uh, but we have a very long history of presuming culturally that we have to do everything. We have to go from birth to death. We have to do the whole cycle. We have to market. We have to do everything. We need to figure out places where we can fit differently. So our recommendations um, have included a multi-year benchmarking program, a tracking program to understand better about our profitability, um, to encourage shared learning cohorts of farmers. I, I um, reported to you last year that we were sending folks um, to a ranching for profit shared school. We've got some really great information back from that, what the shared learning cohort really did for them. Um, there's a whole lot of opportunity around genetics and there's a really amazing opportunity. We've got recommendations around partnering between beef and dairy farmers in a number of different ways, um, both to share infrastructure, to crossbreed dairy and beef cows, and to potentially um, work together on marketing opportunities as well. So those are some of our recommendations. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. Uh, now we'll open it up for <clears throat> questions. Uh, Brian? Thank you, Senator. So I have a question for uh, Mr. White, is it? Um, we've been looking at a seed certification bill in the Senate Ag Committee and taking testimony from a couple of folks. And I noticed one of your recommendations is for a three to five year rollout, kind of a time period. 
I think there's some consensus on the community that we tr would tr like to try to get something done this year. So I'm just wondering where that three to five year time frame came from. Is there anything we could do this year? Yes, you, you could start start the process. Uh, so seed and genetic development, I'm not a seedsman, but ba basically in order to uh, reach stability so that the seeds I'm selling you are true to their parents and what you are expecting to to get in your field uh, uh, lives, lives up to its name is going to take several years. It's just the nature of it's the nature of the, of the genetics. Yeah. So, so you you start by identifying those growers that uh, ideally have some experience and certainly some interest and passion in in developing uh, genetics of regional value, mm -hmm. and and over uh, the next two, you know, they could. Potentially put, they'll put seed out into the field the first year, but they won't be commercially at scale uh, for three years probably. Okay. Yep. Um, I see someone. There. Tom. Tom. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I have a grass fed question. I read recently that there's a certain nutritional um, benefits to grass fed beef. Do you want to comment on that? And are you using are you using that in your marketing strategy? Um, technically, no, because I'm not marketing on behalf of the farmers, but I can answer the question. Um, I, I also am also a diversified livestock farmer, but not a beef producer. Um, yes, uh, the, there is data that um, shows that there's a suite of conju conjugated linoleic fatty acids, which do tend to be higher from fresh forages, um, particularly um, uh, vicenic acid um, is one. There's, there's data to support this. Um, the, the, it is, so I should back up also, regardless, beef is a nutritionally dense food re regardless of how, of the production method itself. The protein does not um, radically change, the mineral content does not radically change depending upon the way that um, the, the meat itself is produced. It's still a, a high value uh, product. The data shows us that we see more beneficial fatty acids in an animal that was finished on highly um, vegetated, lush forages. Um, we've got some Vermont data on that. We're actually starting to, um, uh, we have some funding to uh, start uh, collecting fatty acid samples from a variety of um, uh, beef production systems. Um, we haven't started that yet, but that's something that we're actually looking to do as well. So I hope I answered your Yes, yes you did. Rose? I have a question about goats. Yeah. Uh, and also just to say that goats are super cute, and if you don't have them in your Instagram feed, you really should. <laughs> if you're scrolling through and you see goats, it's just like always so fun. So uh, it's a great marketing opportunity. You guys, uh, a lot of goat producers have great Instagram feeds. Um, but my question is about goat meat, which is kind of crazy because they're cute, but then we also want to eat them maybe. Um, um, and that is, is uh, it, are there production facilities um, in Vermont that, that process goats and is that an issue or is there are, is there sufficient supply of those facilities? Yeah, so there is there is um, there is slaughtering houses that are taking um, goats uh, and there is uh, Vermont Chabon who is um, um, is developing a brand and um, doing byproduct right now their primary market is um, selling half carcass to restaurants in Boston and New York. Okay. And they just launched a new product in partnership with uh, Vermont Salumi, which is uh, a good salumi. So th there, is, there is a beginning um, of uh, processing, but also marketing of um, this, this, new, uh, this new product. Okay, so there are sufficient uh, processing facilities at this point. At this point, point, but as we scale, something I missed to mention is, you know, by 2024, we are looking at another 20 to be at 25 million pounds of goods milk from a demand perspective. Um, I think Jasper Hill is also looking at another five million. So when you look at 30 million pounds um, over, you know, the next couple of years, um, 
all that supply chain support system needs to be scaled. So yeah. although right now mm -hmm. it's sufficient, it's not going to be one of the next four years. Got it. Okay. And just to add a point to that, um, in the next round of briefs, we are going to be we are looking at the overall meat processing infrastructure in the right. state, and uh, we will have a brief mm -hmm. specific to that and try to look at some of these projections of what the, where the industries, the different industries, whether that's beef, whether that's sheep, whether that's goat, where is that hogs, where is that going, and, and do we have sufficient infrastructure? We looked at this very extensively back in 2011 to 2014, and a bunch of infrastructure came online. But we're getting the sense that we're in. We need to do another wave of that kind of infrastructure investment. But we want to quantify what that looks like before we really jump in full. That makes a lot of sense. And I've heard for goats in particular, the new American market may be a burgeoning yeah. market. Yeah. Too. Yeah. It's just uh, yeah, the <laughs> processing. So sheep and goat processing is generally thought to be under capacity in the state of Vermont. Um, processors don't see that as uh, as profitable as say um, you know processing at scale as mm -hmm. beef or uh, yeah. pork. Um, so some people have lost. Uh, I know that some sheep producers have lost slots in processing facilities because of that. Mm -hmm. um, so and you know, the go processing right now is not at scale. So you know capacity is meeting this current um, production value. Yeah. Got it. Uh, okay. Yes, I do. Um, Jen, to what do you attribute the uh, loss in uh, grazed acres in the state of Vermont? Oh gosh, I, I think it's coming from a lot of things. I think um, it's it's been coming from um, uh, dairy farmers aging and um, going out, and uh, I think it's also been um, pressure from housing development has been certainly part of it. Uh, a lot of the farmers that, that reach out to us for grazing technical assistance have either purchased a farm that's grown up into scrub and trees, it isn't considered any longer. Um, it could be that it was land that was played, played out, it could be that it went out in the 80s. You know, I mean, some of this has been a trajectory for a really long time. I also question, we were just having a conversation about this, the grazing conference this last weekend about these numbers and where they come from. So, so a conundrum here too is that young new farmers aren't necessarily in the, in, um, the USDA NAS agricultural statistics system. And the folks who have been reporting may not be farming any longer, so they may not be reporting. So this may be under-reporting <coughs> out there. We're not entirely sure. And I realize these are the best numbers we have to work with. It's not that I'm going to criticize them, but there's are we declining in some ways because we're not counting what is actually happening? Yeah. So I hope, I hope that's true. I hope yeah. that's actually true. Yeah, me too. Well, if we could get more goats on that land that's sort of turning sort of back, it would straighten that land right <laughs> out <laughs> and get some hemp going. Um, I will say I'm a sheep producer and go small ruminants. Um, I'm a sheep producer and I, I purchased an old farm that had just run, run down. Years yeah. ago, so. And how many more goat farms or goats could we, could you handle in your production of goat milk without? We don't want to cause that to, and use it as a commodity market. To, no, absolutely to not. And I think that's why Vermont's dairy industry is poised is to really differentiate it with the quality of the product that they have, and you look at the cheeses that we have, some of the best cheese in the world, and it's really created those, using those products to drill back value into the supply chain. I think it's very important. So we have to stay high quality premium price, so then we can pay a premium price for goods to make transfer your question. We need 10 more farms over the next five years with 400 to 500 goods each. Yeah, so four or five, yeah. Yes. yeah. And do I have, have I read that you you had milk brought from Quebec or yes. Canada yeah. now? Yeah, because to, there is not enough within the state of Vermont and uh, to support the growth of the consumer demand. We are uh, right now we are partnering with goat farms in uh, in Quebec and Ontario. Yeah, and uh, if I could, uh, a question is in regards to hemp. Uh, we took some testimony this week, yesterday maybe, on 
A lot of hemp producers are putting black plastic down in, uh, you know, to help with the weed uh, problem. And black plastic is not very uh, good to recycle. We haven't figured out anybody that'll take it. And I'm wondering, is there something that could be made from hemp fiber that you could use to cover the plants uh, that would, uh, you know, uh, be biodegradable so it would rot and go into the soil rather than having additional plastics laying around and having trouble to get rid of it? Uh, I think you bring up, well, two things come to mind. One is, uh, that's a research question and plenty of opportunities to look at how fiber can fit into existing systems, food production, uh, industry, et cetera. So I don't have a, an answer directly to that, um, but it's something, among other questions, how can hemp be utilized? How can hemp get thrown in Vermont? Best be utilized, or for this would probably not be an agricultural uh, uh, fabric producing state, but where there is where there are thousands of acres being produced, these are the kinds of farms that are going to be contributing the, the raw material for that kind of product. The other point I'd make is um, from uh, farms that I visited this year and uh, worked on as well, hemp farms, uh, there's more plastic being used than is necessary, or to put it this way, um, given another year or two, I think we're going, we are going to see less plastic being used because the uh, equipment um, and the methodologies that are uh, that would replace plastic are now being understood and utilized. Yeah. At, at, at a start this year, every, many many people were late in getting crops in the ground, and the go-to was plastic, and that's the that was the default. Being only three years into commercial production mm -hmm. of hemp, um, that's what we're seeing. But there is a huge. Uh, opportunity to, to develop new methods that work. Uh, John? I just had a quick goat question. I think we heard last week there were, what, 36 or 37 goat dairies in the state? Okay. Um, and I wondered how many of those, if any, have, have transitioned from being cow dairies to goat dairies? Not that many. Not that many. And I think it's, uh, it has to do, you, you got to prove to a farmer that you can make money <laughs> out of whether it's a cow or a goat. So we really needed to vet that um, financial model first, gather reliable data. What we found is 400 goats, it's the, it's the, the benchmark to support the family. And we want to make sure that as we start communicating and, and recruiting farmers that we present a business model that is viable and, and, and sustainable. Um, so right now we have a pretty important project uh, going on with a farm in Stowe, uh, fifth generation cow dairy producers that uh, came to us and said if we don't do anything different, this is the last generation farming. And so we, um, I ran into <coughs> my office and said, how are we going to do this? Um, and so we could be potentially looking at our, our first food transition um, in May of this year, uh, from going from 300 cow to 1,000 goats. Wow. Very mm -hmm. excited about that one. Now, do they, do they have robots that milk the goats, too? Or? <laughs> yeah. Rotary robots. Um, they are pretty uh, popular in Europe and in um, Canada, but you have to have the skills. So it exists. There is robots yeah. for goats. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, as a follow-up to this goat uh, conversation, and as somebody who used to milk goats, um, we had a farmer uh, eight or ten years ago in the state house who had heard about goats, and he began to transition from cows to goats, and Actually, for a while, the goats were carrying the cows and ultimately went completely to goats. Um, he had some problems, and it had to do with the nature of goats and how their PI counts can be high. 
at certain times uh, when they're in heat. And really, you know, you have a, a real necessity potentially for two barns uh, in order to keep them separate. And so I'm wondering um, how much technical assistance is available to people who are potentially considering transitioning so that they have a, a full understanding of what they're going to get into? You raise a really important issue. There is not right now. And that's yeah. why we're looking to partner with um, Vermont Technical College to really build this body of knowledge because we bring a demand, but we have to make sure that those producers who transition are successful financially and then also with the right support exactly to that point. Yeah. <clears throat> um, other questions? If not, uh, thank, thank you all very much for participating. Yeah, thank you so much for having me the presentation. Now, yeah, right. So, um, so in, in wrapping up, uh, uh, I just want to thank you for your time uh, here. Great questions. And we hope that um, as we go forward in the session, that you'll take advantage of these amazing lead authors and the contributors, many of whom you heard from today, and others that are in the room, um, because they they really care and they really are interested uh, in being helpful to you all to advance these recommendations. Um, as, I, as I said earlier, there was just a lot of excitement about the opportunity to participate and to um, develop this report, and a real understanding that there's that we really are at this inflection point within Vermont agriculture, and so with that inflection point comes a lot of risk, a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, uh, a lot of trepidation, but also. The flip side is a lot of opportunity to really explore uh, and dig into. And I think you know we have built, as you heard from, from Ella uh, Chapin, we have really invested in and built an incredible support system around our front front food businesses. We need more of it as we continue to grow the sector, but we have a really strong foundation from which to build. Uh, and we are so far ahead of so many other states in that regard um, and our, our a lot of other states are very envious of what we have uh, going on here. Um, so do you want to cover the next steps? With yeah, so process? of those 119 recommendations that are included, which is a lot, and this is quite a document. I, I actually felt it today for the first time, and I, I was surprised at its, at its breadth. So there's a lot of information in here, and you heard just a subset of some of the um, lead contributors and authors sharing what they know and, and what went into creating the brief topics that they were a part of. Um, of those 119 recommendations, there is a portion of those that are policy related, not all. Some are about kind of program development that can happen organically. Some of it is about um, the support structure for the industry or, or information gathering around a, one of the issues that wouldn't necessarily be appropriate for um, policy development. But there's probably a third of the recommendations, you know, 20, 30 in here that are policy related. And it's an opportunity for you to look at those over the coming session or years to see um, what opportunity might exist there within, within your conversations. Um, and that may be part of what additional testimony looks like from, from these um, lead authors and others. And it's great that you can kind of flip through and see who the, the lead author was, as well as the contributors to each of those specific briefs. Um, yeah, and the, from the timeline. And so then, as we mentioned in the beginning, these 23 are just the beginning. So there's another 30 some odd that will come over the next year that are equally as important and equally as complex. And there'll be another you know, 100 to 200 additional recommendations that will come out of those briefs, we suspect. So Ellen, I think you can walk through the timeline um, for those 32 yeah. as it's designed. If you flip to page 11, um, they have a little graphic there to tell you how, how 2020 is shaping up. So as Emmy mentioned, we have this additional 32 product market issue briefs that are currently under development. I think their first drafts are due next week. So we are well under the way. Um, my team is like, oh, great, we get to do this again <laughs> after what we just went through. Um, but we're, we're up for the challenge. Uh, so what will happen is once those uh, drafts 
uh, work their way through first draft, second draft, final, uh, and layout and such. Then over the summer months, you'll see there, uh, we're planning a, a stakeholder engagement process where we'll be reaching back out to all the different Farm to Plate network members, uh, trade associations, private sector folks that have been engaged in various stages to be able to then show the entire breadth and say, okay, of all these recommendations, of all these opportunities that we've identified and these gaps and bottlenecks, what are the highest of the highest priorities? That's important. Yes. So we want to try to build additional consensus around what is the vision for the next five to ten years? What is the roadmap for the next five to ten years? And of all the things we could do, if we could only do some small subset, what is the highest priority and what is the level of both financial and human capital need to be able to pull that off? That will then go into an actual, a, a more sort of classic, you, you probably look for an actual plan uh, that will become the Fire to Plate uh, 2.0 plan, and we will deliver that to you next January 15th um, with that additional refinement. <coughs> that, that process will also lead to the Fire to Plate network to be restructured. So you remember last week when we were in talking about the front of plate uh, plan in a report, there's a diagram of all the different groups of organizations that come together around a specific set of recommendations. That will get reorganized and repopulated with organizations and private sector individuals and, and uh, agency staff that want to then really tackle a, a number of these recommendations. So those recommendations will then have a home of people to actually be moving them forward, um, especially those ones that don't need a, a policy fix or something like that, but are more market development, more marketing oriented, more product development oriented. They will have a home and a group of people to be working on them. So that's what we're, we've got on deck for the next 12 months. Chris? Um, I just want to echo the thanks for everybody. I, I look forward to digging through this <coughs> very much. Um, I'm curious if uh, we talk a lot about farm to plate, and I feel like the summary of today is more like farm to market, and and I can't help but wonder, you know, we still are importing a humongous portion of what we eat here in the state, of what our institutions are serving, et cetera, and is that something you didn't focus on here on intentionally, or is there? I mean, the, the farm to school stuff was very clear, but uh, I'm just wondering if you could comment, are we sort of shifting strategies, or is that strategy considered well underway, or uh, I'd like to understand that, because it hasn't been a big focus of today. Yeah, it's true. We didn't, there was only so much time we felt we could hold your attention this morning to run through these briefs. Yeah, you've done well to keep that. <laughs> I mean, very I, diplomatic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think the market briefs would actually be a really good, you know, if I were to suggest conversation to have in committee. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the four that were developed in this first round um, were selected intentionally because they represent where we have the greatest success and where we see the greatest opportunity. Retail markets is something that came up over and over again as a theme about um, real opportunity for growth. Um, in both the brief work as well as some of the recent market development work that's happened at the agency, looking specifically at maple and specialty cheese. Sort of really looking at how do we build these retail market opportunities. So I think there's some really robust conversations that could happen around the four that were included in this first round, and then there's a four additional markets that will be in this second round that we'll start to get to look at. And I would just also say that I don't think the plate part is irrelevant at this point. Like we haven't shifted, but there is, and there is a consumer demand brief in here that's actually really good and looks looks at the consumer trends because I think what we've really tried to uh, um, grow here in our awareness of an entire food system that goes from farm all the way to plate is that every part of that supply chain is important to focus on to make sure that we're really hitting on all cylinders. And what we have seen has been a lack of uh, or insufficient 
focus on how consumer trends are changing and then how do you get that information back to producers so that they can adapt to that changing marketplace, knowing that they're going to have to go through the market channel in order to get that product to the consumer. And so I think what you'll see over the coming uh, year is a lot more conversation about how, to, how are we going to do those linkages better? How do we make sure that that information gets to who needs it better and faster? Do, do we, can I just follow up or we? Well, I just, I, I just wanted you to. You got one follow up and so grab it quick. Yeah, go for it. No, well, no, I, I, I mean, are we ever going to get to the point where uh, someone goes to the store and just buys lettuce that happens to be made in Vermont as opposed to the, the notion that people that will be demanding it. That, that's where I, 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 there's obviously people at the leading edge who are, we need them to be building this demand. But, but it just strikes me that part of the reason I focus on schools and institutions is that sort of seems the strategy to build the infrastructure that might get us to the point of, I don't know where it's from. I just went to the supermarket. It turns out the supermarket took care of it being local. You see what I mean? Absolutely. Do, do we, I assume that's part of the overall vision. Yes, although Vermont, Vermont will never be able to produce all of what we want to eat in all market channels. We're just too small. We don't have the land base. We don't have the infrastructure. It's just not there. Even I'd settle for 50%. <laughs> <laughs> it's a reasonable. Yeah. Well, there is a regional vision to get to 50% caloric <laughs> intake by 2060. But that is going to require 6 million more acres to come under production. Okay. And to ship in the region, all across the six states, a lot of which would come from Maine, and, and, a, and more acreage in Vermont. And it would require a shift uh, away from uh, certain types of agricultural production and into more grass-based uh, oriented agriculture. So there are those visions out there. What's lacking is an actual drilling down to say, OK, what is Vermont's share of that? And how would we actually do that? Okay. Thank Plus, you. we got to get away from the U.S. cheap food policy. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So what I found eye-opening, Chris, was, and I don't know if it was presented to you as well, but when Ellen and the Jake were in our committee last week, um, there was sort of a side um, uh, pamphlet, and I don't think I got the, the hard wholesale copy. wholesale report, yeah. The Local Foods Wholesale Market Assessment, which indicated, I mean, it's just eye-opening what the, what the, how complicated it is in a way to get into the wholesale market and the price point so that a four eighty four dollar and eighty nine cent pint of of cherry tomatoes is worth about a dollar what dollar thirty eight ultimately to the farmer because of the far the distributor the retailer and all the trade allowances that uh, get added on it's really challenging yeah, we heard. yeah. so um, we're gonna wrap this up. And one other little thing that we, you may want to look at, we will have to, is program new things, new initiatives that might have to take two years to uh -huh. get done rather than yep. one, and and sort that out yep. so we don't get headed down a road that there's no end to. Sure. So with that, um, I want to thank all you folks for coming. I, I want to acknowledge Linda Lehman, who didn't get introduced earlier, and our staff attorney for both committees, Michael O'Grady, that sat through this and <laughs> will, will be uh, of great assistance in the future. That's awesome. Um, and, uh, thank you for the opportunity to do this. Yes. It was it was it was difficult to meet the timeline, but ultimately, um, it was uh, really a worthwhile project. So thank you for the opportunity yeah, and the push. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Everybody. All of you. Yeah.